In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about LZ4 and Z standard compression, avoiding problems, triggers simplify, and indexes can hurt. I'm Creston Jamison, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 263. All right, I hope you, your friends, family, and coworkers continue to do well. Our first piece of content is LZ4 in Z standard PG dump compression in PostgreSQL 16. This is from cyber.postgresql.com, and they're talking about how LZ4 and Z standard compression have been added to Postgres in previous versions for doing compression with toast storage, but now with Postgres 16, you can actually use that as options in PG dump. And this post is great because it shows you the different performance and the different compression sizes you can get with these different variants. And I've mentioned before on scaling Postgres that Z standard has been phenomenal to use. I've been using it instead of gzip for a couple of years now, and it's been fantastic in terms of how fast it works and how small the data sizes are. And this post shows that explicitly here. So he tests PG dump with LZ4, Z standard, and gzip. And you can see the performance sizes. It looks like Z standard is the fastest here. And these are with different compression levels. It looks like LZ4 wins here. Again, these are just the speeds. And here Z standard comes out up on top again. But look at these compression sizes where LZ4 is at 48 megabytes, Z standard is at eight megabytes. So that's a six times smaller file. It's three times smaller than the gzip file. So just look at these sizes. This is why I keep on saying how much I love Z standard as a compression tool. So it's great that it's being added to PG dump. So now it will be built in. Although I've just been piping it to Z standard to do my backups. But if you want to learn more, definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, nine ways to shoot yourself in the foot with PostgreSQL. This is from philbooth.me. And this post does exactly what it's going to say, show you nine things you shouldn't do. Now, I'm not going to agree with all of these, and I'll actually mention some counterpoints for some of them. But the first point is, keep the default value for work mem. So basically, you shouldn't do that. And he says, basically, because as your database becomes larger and more complex queries, you start running into disk merges if you have a small work memory, and that will lead to definitely much lower performance for queries. And he gives some recommendations to try and check for that using PG Analyze, a paid for tool, or PG Badger to look in your logs for things. But generally, I don't agree with this first point. I actually like to keep my work memory at its default or maybe bump it up just slightly, but then monitor PG stat statements to see what queries are suddenly performing worse. You basically want to see if you're getting disk merges and then strategically determine if you want to up your work memory for that. Because a lot of times as you're growing or scaling your database, you're adding many more connections. And then that means that much work memory is being used for each connection. So you don't want to run out of memory that way. Like a previous post, I think from the build.com was talking about someone who had set two terabytes of work memory or something insane like that. So basically I like to empirically determine what it should be just by testing and, and running in real world scenarios. And the other thing to keep in mind with work memory is that you can set it per session. So if you have a database that does 90% real-time transactions, you can have a relatively low work memory. And if you have say 10% reporting, well then create another user or set a certain session that has a larger work memory to be able to run those reports and not run into disk merges. So I don't 100% agree with deciding what you want your work memory to be ahead of time, but to kind of test out what it should be. A second, push all your application logic into Postgres functions and procedures. Definitely agree that you should not be doing that. And we had a whole discussion on this in episode 68 of the Rubber Duck Dev Show about how much business logic to put in your database. And basically, we came to the conclusion it should just be the business logic necessary to maintain your data integrity. So constraints, foreign key references, and maybe a little bit of doing like generated columns. That's probably the extent to which we would do it. The next one is use lots of triggers. Again, you should definitely not be using a lot of triggers, or at least that's my opinion as well, because I equate them to kind of magic. So magical things happen when you insert a field or you update a field. Apart from doing things like audits, which I could see that use case for, and I talked about that in a previous episode of Postgres when 
where we went over the trigger posts. But yes, I definitely agree, should definitely not use a lot of triggers. Next is use notify heavily. I agree with this one too. I think there's just very specific use cases for that. And I actually haven't used that much in practice. And basically I've just been working on a project where we were able to get really far just doing polling. Now this is a little bit different, but you could get pretty darn far just using polling as opposed to waiting for something to, to push or notify. So there are use cases for it, but like he says here, exactly don't use it heavily. In terms of building a queuing system that he mentions here, he showed you a way to do it just by pulling events off of an event queue and using for update skip lock to be sure to just grab the next set. Next one, don't use explain analyze on real data, which means you do want to use it on real data. So ideally a copy of production in some way. It's okay if it's delayed a few days, but basically have that copy of production data when you're doing query analysis. Now you usually can't replicate active queries happening at the same time, but at least have similar data. Six, prefer CTEs over subqueries. And I think this was an issue with previous versions of Postgres, but because with CTEs now, you can actually determine if you want it materialized or not. This reasoning doesn't really apply anymore, and he actually says this in his edit. Seven, use recursive CTEs for time-critical queries. So basically, he's saying you don't want to do that, which I agree, because basically when something is recursive, essentially it's in a loop. It's in a for loop. So whatever query that is is going to be running multiple times. So you don't want something that's going to take a lot of time because whatever query that is, is going to be multiplied by how many times you're iterating over it. Eight, don't add indexes to your foreign keys. That's right. You absolutely should add them to your foreign keys because if you have foreign key references or foreign key constraints and you want to like delete a row, well, that needs to check the other table. So you definitely want indexes on your foreign keys. And nine, compare index columns with is not distinct from. Now, I actually haven't used this statement, but he gives an alternative that you can use instead that's better. So definitely recommend checking this post out for that. But check this post out if you want to learn more. Next piece of content, how Postgres triggers can simplify your backend development. This is from themythicalengineer.com. And on this particular post, I'm actually going to disagree with the premise of it. And he says here, quote, by using triggers, you can offload some of the work that would normally be done in your backend service code to the database mm -hmm. itself. This can simplify your code. Now, I definitely agree with that, but let's just take a look at this. So in his example here, he had application code before the triggers. And you can see there's about this much JavaScript code. And then here, once the triggers are added, the JavaScript code goes to much fewer lines, like maybe less than half the lines. But in order to do that, you had to add this much code and this much code to set up the trigger. Now, again, this is relatively simple. And I hate to say it, but if I was using JavaScript as my backend language, I would probably want to write less of it too. I prefer other languages like Python or Ruby or Elixir for backend languages. But still, it looks like the lines of code is about the same. Now, the problem I see that I've mentioned before is I think triggers are just magic. Things magically happen when you insert something. And a lot of times a developer is not going to know what's going on. And now you have to look at two different code bases to actually see what's going on. And personally, I prefer to explicitly do the transaction within the code so you see it there as opposed to relying on a trigger to do it. But this is one perspective. And at the bottom, he did include a number of comments that echo some of what I'm saying as well. So whereas triggers are a great tool in certain use cases, again, like the last post, I like to use them minimally. But you can check this post out if you want to learn more. The next piece of content, PostgreSQL indexes can hurt you. Negative effects and the cost involved. This is from Procona.com. And this lists about 10 different points, but I think some of these are repeated. So maybe there's about five issues with it that I'll kind of cover. Uh, one is that, of course, anytime you add an index, it has to be maintained. So essentially, you are going to penalize your transactional throughput for each new index you add. So basically, the benefits gained from faster queries need to be offset by that transaction per second hit, for example. Now, this is also going to increase memory usage as you're using more indexes because they're going to be taking part of memory. And it may impact caching because now you're caching those indexes in memory and maybe less data. And third here, he talks about random writes, is that a lot of times when you're inserting data into the table, it's just appended to the end. Whereas updating indexes, you're doing all sorts of random writes based on how many indexes are on that table. Again, from all this activity, it results in more wall that needs to be generated. So your system has to be able to handle that. 
It's talking about more and more I.O. Again, there's more writes every time you update the more indexes that you have on it. There's an impact on vacuum and auto vacuuming. And particularly, I've found the index maintenance time to be the longest period of time. So the more indexes on it, the longer it's going to take that table to be vacuumed. He talks about greater storage requirements. So again, more indexes, more storage, which means less thing cached in memory, but also greater expense for storing things. And then indexes are more prone to corruption. Now, I haven't really had just an index go corrupted, but I have had things here like doing a operating system switch over and have the glibc version change. Now you need to re-index all your indexes. More indexes, the longer that's going to take. And plus, there are a lot of point releases that change index functionality that requires re-indexes. So that's something you need to watch out for and be aware of as you're doing point release upgrades. But if you want to learn more about ways that indexes can hurt you, you can definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content, in defense of PostgreSQL MVCC and vacuuming. This is from softwareandboost.com. And he's discussing where he's heard people complaining about that Postgres uses MVCC. Now, not in the Postgres community, but other database communities saying this is bad. And he's saying that's not necessarily the case. Yes, it does cause issues because you have to deal with table bloat because old versions are kept in the same table as current versions. You have transaction ID wraparound issues and overhead by the visibility map. But he says one of the main reasons or the main advantages of MVCC is that basically nobody gets blocked. Like readers don't block writers. I mean, if something's trying to write the same one, yes, locks are involved but readers will never be blocked by someone trying to write something. Now, when reading this, I was kind of thinking the biggest issue I think with MVCC is when you want to do a lot of updates. So maybe you have a single row, you want to update 1,000, 10,000 times. Well, you're generating 1,000, 10,000 rows in the table when you do that. And then those all have to be vacuumed up. So basically using Postgres for that use case might not be ideal. And it's usually better to actually just do inserts and then delete the old ones later manually or some other process. Now, there was a solution discussed for this called Zheap. So it was a different way to do storage in Postgres. So they actually implemented a way to use different storage engines in a previous version of Postgres. And it looked like Zheap would be a way to have a separate redo log, not store the old versions in the same table. And that could much easily support updating the same row a million times in a table. All those extra rows would be generated in the redo log, for example, as opposed to in the actual table, so you don't have to deal with bloat issues or vacuuming at least that up. But unfortunately, it looks like Zheap was transferred to another organization. I think Cybertech-PostgreSQL has been working on it, and I haven't heard a recent status update on it, so I don't know the state of that. But personally, I think it would be great to have that kind of separate storage engine for that use case. Because a lot of what this blog post is about is that a lot of times, even though Postgres uses MVCC and it has some of those downsides, 95 plus percent of the time, it's fine. There's no issues. It's just certain use cases where it can cause issues. And if we had a different storage mechanism to handle that, then you could use Postgres for more purposes. And he also goes into this talking about some changes that were made in the Yugabyte project, some things that they did differently, some things in the Oriole DB project also. So definitely an interesting post if you want to check it out. Next piece of content, create commands in PostgreSQL releases. This is from peter.eisentrout.org. And he did an interesting thing where he went by Postgres releases and said, what new create commands have been added? So you can see no new create commands were added since version 12, which is a fairly long time. In version 11, you can see they added procedure. So they added the ability to create procedures. In version 10, they added the ability to create publications and subscriptions for doing logical replication, as well as statistics. So these are for handling multi-column statistics. So it's just interesting the history of what they've added in each version. And then the second table here is by new system catalogs added. So by each version, you could see what capabilities have been added by the system catalogs. So this is just a quick post looking at things have changed in different Postgres versions over time. Next piece of content, PG SQL Friday, number eight, PG stat statements. This is from pgmuster.com. And they're announcing the upcoming PG SQL Friday is about PG stat statements, which is my number one extension for doing performance monitoring and assessments for Postgres. And if you're interested in participating in this month's blog topic, you need to get your blog post in by Friday, May 5th, and they have the instructions on how to submit it. So definitely check this out if you're interested in that.
Next piece of content, logical replication permissions in PostgreSQL 15. This is from postgresql.fastware.com. And they're talking about how currently only super users are allowed to create subscriptions. So if you want to do logical replication from one database to another, you actually have to create that subscription as a super user. In addition, prior to 15, quote, if a subscription was created by a super user who was later demoted to a non-super user, the subscription apply workers and table sync workers would continue to apply the logical replication changes. So basically, they considered this a security violation because someone no longer has permissions, but yet the subscription keeps chugging right along, synchronizing data. So a change was made in 15 to no longer allow this. So basically, if you demote a user to a non-super user, you're no longer able to access that data. And this is in preparation to allow non-super users to create subscriptions. So now that logical replication has a permissions-based concept, the idea is to now allow non-super users to create subscriptions. So this is pretty great. They go into some of the changes with 15, and this kind of leads to the promise of allowing non-super users to create subscriptions. But if you want to learn more, check out this blog post. Next piece of content, waiting for Postgres 16, running explain on any query, even with variable parameters. This is from pganalyze.com, and this is the next episode of 5 Minutes of Postgres. And in this episode, he covers the explain generic plan that's new in Postgres 16 that Cybertech like PostgreSQL did. We discussed this last week, but it's basically allows you to get a generic plan for parameterized queries. So if you're interested in Lucas's perspective on that, check out this piece of content. Next piece of content, PostgreSQL basics, getting started with PSQL. This is from redgate.com. And this is a very basic post about just how to get PSQL installed on your system to be able to communicate with Postgres. So they show how to install it on Linux and Windows and Mac OS. Props to mentioning Linux first. <laughs> but that's basically what this post does, as well as explaining how to connect to a database. Next piece of content, structured Postgres regression tests. This is from yrashk.com, and he's talking about a tool called PG Regress that does regression tests for Postgres. So basically, it takes an SQL file, sends it to Postgres, gets the output, and then on subsequent runs, it compares that output again to see if there are any regressions. So basically, if you make a change, you want to make sure you haven't broken anything. And he said the issue he had with it is that the test looks like this. It just shows you the pure text output. And ideally, you would want something more structured in your test because you don't want like a space to be off here or something. So we actually chose to use YAML. So now with this much more structured YAML file for checking the results, he released a new tool called PGY Regress. So if you're interested in using this type of tool for doing regression tests, but using a more structured YAML as opposed to just a text output, definitely check out this new tool. Next piece of content. PGOSM Flex for Production OpenStreetMap Data. This is from rustproofLabs.com. And this is a project that helps you load OpenStreetMap datasets into PostGIS. And that's probably the extent of my knowledge. If you want to learn more about that, you can definitely check out this blog post. Next piece of content. There was another episode of Postgres FM last week. This one was on queues in Postgres. So they discussed the pros and cons of, I guess, doing queuing in Postgres versus dedicated queuing tools and some tips for scaling. So if you're interested in that, you can listen to the episode or watch the YouTube video as well. Next piece of content, the PostgreSQL person of the week is Sebastian Lierder. If you're interested in learning more about Sebastian and his contributions to Postgres, definitely check out this blog post. And the last piece of content, we did have another episode of the Rubber Duck Dev Show this past Thursday afternoon. This one was on All About Rhoda with Jeremy Evans. So Rhoda is a Ruby toolkit. He didn't call it really a framework, but a toolkit for building web applications using Ruby. So if that type of content is of interest to you, we welcome you to check out our show. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode, or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.